Brand. I wish you'd run for office. <laughs> Woo! Uh, our next reader tonight is Len Shindell. Len Shindell began working at Sparrows Point in 1973. He served as a shop steward and full-time rep for USW Locals 2609 and 9477 during his 29 years in the mill. While frequently writing newsletters on issues facing his coworkers, he was fortunate also to have some of his pieces published in the Other Voices section of the Baltimore Evening Sun, poetry journals, and periodicals. He currently works as a media specialist for an international union in, in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Len. Good evening, and thanks so much to uh, Deborah and John for inviting us here. Thanks to everybody who came out. You know, it could be rather daunting as union activists and leaders to deal with Bethlehem Steel and its corporate arrogance during its heyday as a Fortune 500 corporation. But we were always comforted and boosted by the support we got from outside the plant. And writers were such an important base of that sustenance. I owe a personal debt of gratitude to Mike Bowler, who made space for me and other writers in the Other Voices column of the Evening Sun. The early work of Mark Ruder, covering fatalities in the mill for the sun, and his book Sparrow's Point, helped others understand the human toll of intolerable working conditions at the point. The reporting of Joan Jacobson, Rafael Alvarez, and others, joined by still more books, Elmer Hall, Deborah's Roots of Steel, Karen Olson's book, Wives of Steel, and Crisis in Bethlehem by John Strohmeyer, the former editor of the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania Globe Times, have added to our understanding of the dynamics underlying the demise of an iconic corporation and workplace. These writings help put our activism in context and open windows to life and its challenges inside the mill to our outside community and policymakers. Adjoining the work of Baltimore writers, we were fortunate to draw support from a wide range of folks in academia and the professions. The late Dr. Jim Keough at City Hospital, Drs. Grace Seam, Jane Halpern, Janet Plass, conducted mortality and toxicology studies that documented the dangers of asbestos and chemical exposure. The video One Voice, produced by Linda Zeidman and Stan Markowitz at Essex Community College, celebrated the struggles that led to the formation of our union at Sparrows Point. We're fortunate that the instructors and students at UMBC and Towson are continuing to collect those oral histories. The legal advocacy of the late Judge Kenneth Johnson and the late attorney Luther C. West helped challenge discrimination not just at Sparrows Point, but throughout the steel industry. Labor educators, the late Dr. Everett Miller and Bill Berry, helped train our shop stewards to appreciate the proud history of working class struggle at Sparrows Point and beyond. And Bill's doing, Bill did some archiving that we should have done years ago, um, keeping our records intact and setting up a web, website and oral history. We owe these folks. And I think one of the tragedies of the shutdown of Sparrows Point plant is the loss of these connections between friends who learn so much from each other as we struggle together for good, healthy jobs and economic and social justice. Now, circling back to our nonfiction community, I know I'm not the only one here who has a special place in my heart for experienced writers who help others tell their stories. The Institute for Career Development was a collectively bargained benefit funded by several major steel companies that offered steel workers the opportunity to take classes across a wide range of interests, some useful to advancement on their jobs in the mill, some to help seek other careers. The Institute enlisted poet and novelist Jimmy Santiago Baca to conduct a workshop with steel workers aimed at producing a volume of original work, focusing on their experience in the steel industry under Baca's tutelage, The Heat was born, a volume of poignant, compelling narratives by workers in the mills. One of our union brothers who wrote for The Heat, Jerry Ernest, couldn't be with us tonight, but with the gracious help of local videographers, we're able to carry Jerry's story from The Heat to you this evening. 
and Amazon still has copies of the heat available if folks are interested. And if you're on the market for an amazing autobiography of pain, redemption, and hope, I highly recommend A Place to Stand by Jerry's teacher, the amazing Jimmy Santiago Baca. Before Jerry takes the stage, I'll read two stories that I wrote for the Evening Sun quite a while ago. The first one is from 1991, Diary of Death in a Steel Mill. October 1st, men leaving, men leaving work tell me that a co-worker has been crushed to death by a tractor this morning. Outside the locker room, a group is discussing the tragedy in grisly detail. Yes, yeah, says one, they told one of the laborers to spray the blood off the steel coil so they could ship it to the customer. They say the tractor operator looked at him lying there and screamed and just took off running. I walked slowly into the locker room, thinking back to the rainy night when I was a passenger in a car that hit a woman crossing the street. I still see her face against the windshield, and I remember running two blocks to the emergency room, running to escape that face. David Hamlet's death on this day is trauma and irony. Just two weeks ago, I sent a complaint to Moshe, the Maryland Occupational Safety and Health Administration, detailing our repeated problems with faulty, dangerous tractors and Bethlehem's lack of attention to those problems. I report to my job, and I'm immediately approached by my foreman. He says, I'm sure by now you've heard about the accident. Be sure to check your tractor to make sure everything is in working order. He was one of the supervisors who ignored the complaints that were before OSHA. October 2nd. People are talking death in every corner of the mill. Some workers say that a faulty tractor was to blame. The company is spreading the word that the accident was caused by the operator's error. Everyone here, everywhere one hears the refrain, why does someone have to be killed before they get serious about safety? The tractors in the finishing mills are battery-driven mammoth blocks of steel on wheels. They have two booms extending forward, which enter the eyes of steel coils that will one day be transformed into tin cans, hot water heaters, and roofs. Most of the tractors are 30 years old with a lifting capacity of 50,000 pounds or less. The marketplace, however, is demanding larger and larger coils. The tractors are being overloaded, making steering more difficult. One of the complaints Moshe is investigating Next door to the galvanizing lines where I work, Bethlehem is constructing a world-class coating line at a cost of $150 million. I marvel at the speed and the efficiency of construction. But here things are falling apart. Concrete floors are crumbling from the constant pounding of tractors. Laborers who repair the floors are on frequent layoff. Cost cuts, they say. One of the tractors we operate has faulty booms. When we hit a rough section of floor, the coils may slide off the forks. That's another complaint before Moshe. Another of the tractors, the fastest in the mill, suddenly loses power, forcing its operator to engage foot brakes rather than the usual method of plugging in reverse. In the ensuing seconds, anyone in that vehicle's path may become the next David Hamlet. Moshe is investigating. The Tractor Maintenance Department has issued a memorandum advising that it is unwise and by implication unsafe to conduct tractors with insufficiently charged batteries. But the company has reduced the crews responsible for charging batteries. It says it must cut man hours per ton. <coughs> October 23rd, a note on the cafeteria wall says that a collection is being taken up for the tractor operator whose vehicle crushed David Hamlet. She's hospitalized for psychological stress. Leaving work, I encounter a coworker standing next to a red can. He asks for a donation for David Hamlet's family. I reach into my pocket. The collection is an attempt to relieve the powerlessness we feel when one of our own is killed. Walking to my car, I think how much more fitting it would be if in David Hamlet's memory we rediscover the fortitude needed to enforce the safety clause of our contract. 
Article 14.3 allows us to refuse to work unsafely until the matter is investigated and corrected or reviewed by an arbitrator. Maybe when we shut down some production lines, we can get some real safety. October 24th, word has it that Bethlehem Steel may be cited by Mosh for a willful violation in the death of David Hamlet. Bethlehem will no doubt appeal. If it loses the appeal, it can pay the fine with profits from the coil that was coated with the blood of David Hamlet. The next piece was also on 1992, uh, entitled, They Acted Like Men and They Were Treated Like Men. Francis Brown, 61, has worked at Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point plant for 36 years. He was one of the leaders of steel and shipyard workers for equality, which formed in the early 1960s. Later, he was an elected official of the Steel Workers Union, Local 2610. He's now collecting documents of the black steel workers' struggle to be placed in the archives of the Morgan State University's Soper Library. Mr. Brown bitterly remembers applying for work at Bethlehem Steel's employment office in 1956. I went to trade school, he says, and it seems like they would have wanted to put me in a trade or a craft, but they gave me a shovel. And when I got on the job, I met men who had gone to Howard University in Morgan and they had shovels too. David Carroll, who retired in 1988, applied for work with a group of black men who had some college education. A few were rejected. As they left the employment office, an older janitor came up to them and advised them to come back the next day, but don't dress so neat and tell them that you never graduated from high school. They took the advice and they were hired. Bethlehem Steel was a segregated dominion ripe for the revolt that was born in the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. Says Mr. Brown, conditions in the departments were separate and unequal. In the toilet facilities, blacks were mostly upstairs, whites downstairs. The people who cleaned the toilets were 99% black. He recalls his first involvement in the struggle. I was talking in the locker room and an employee by the name of Francis Bernard Jones said, you have plenty of mouth, but no action. I just sat down at the lunchroom. They will not serve blacks. I'm going back tomorrow. Are you going with me? And I said, yes. Francis Bernard Jones, said Francis Brown, happened to be the steelworkers Rosa Parks. The next day we went to the union hall to talk to the president and one of the other officers. They told us that if we continued that kind of action, they would take no responsibility for our jobs. We got really angry. We headed straight down to the Congress of Racial Equality on Gay and Eden Streets. Corps encouraged the formation of steel and shipyard workers for equality. The group grew as it organized against Bethlehem's unit seniority system. Black workers were hired into the hottest, dirtiest units. Said Mr. Brown, if, if you ask for a transfer to a white unit for a better job, or a higher paying job. The transfer was sent to the employment office and you were put in the posture of quitting your job. If the plant was hiring that day, you had a chance of getting hired. The comradeship which was born in mobilizing Bethlehem's workers radiated into Baltimore's African American community. Black steel workers founded the Faro Social Club on Collington Avenue near North Avenue, not too far from where we are today. Pharaohs became a meeting place, not just for steel workers, but for other Baltimoreans active in the civil rights struggle. Many steel workers were paid Corps' assistance by joining the organization and supporting its local activities. The steel workers began to hold pickets and marches at the U.S. Department of Labor in Washington and at Bethlehem Steel's corporate headquarters in Pennsylvania. Aided by attorney Kenneth Johnson, later a circuit court judge, and the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, steelworkers filed complaints with the Employment Equal Employment Opportunity Commission against Bethlehem Steel, alleging that the corporation's seniority practices perpetuated discrimination. Some of these complaints were joined by women workers at the plant, and similar complaints were pending in other steel towns across the country. 
1974, Bethlehem and eight other steelmakers agreed to a consent decree to end unit seniority. Transfer opportunities were enhanced, and transferred workers could now promote in units on the basis of their plant seniority. And the, the decree offered back pay and provided affirmative action for blacks and women in the skilled trades. Intense polarization met the signing of the consent decree. A group of white workers collected money for a lawsuit to return to unit seniority, arguing that a deluge of unskilled workers would destroy the mills. Posters for Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan rallies were seen on the walls in some areas. The average back paycheck under the consent decree was less than $1,000. David Carroll formed the 21st Century Labor Council to encourage black workers to refuse the checks and continue litigation uh, for more back pay and stronger seniority provisions. Some 592 checks amounting to $566,000 went uncashed, though the litigation failed. In the 1970s economic crisis, enveloped the steel industry as a whole, and entire mills like Bethlehem Steel's pipe mill shut down. The plant seniority provisions of the consent decree permitted both black and white workers to find new opportunities in other departments. And many of those who had opposed the consent decree now became its defenders, its beneficiaries. Affirmative action and craft jobs did not reach the industry until it was already in its decline. While some black and women workers entered the crafts, the struggle has resumed. Recently, grievances were filed by black and women workers calling on Bethlehem to restore apprenticeship programs. Francis Brown often ponders how the struggle changed things at Bethlehem Steel. He said, years ago, where everywhere they went in this plant, blacks were on their knees, hat in hand. They would stand outside an office until someone asked them to come in. They wouldn't walk in and ask questions, and everybody white was mister. Now they acted like men, and they were treated like men. A few weeks ago, Mr. Brown was approached by one of the early leaders of Steelworkers for Equality. He smiled and shook my hand, said Francis. He said that he was just promoted to assistant roller, next to the top job in the newly modernized hot mill. He wouldn't have that job today if we hadn't fought like we did. Thank you very much.